Hi everyone, my name is Ori David and you're welcome to the Ori David Consult channel. So today we shall be interrogating a very important topic in company law. However, before I delve into today's matter, it is important that I enjoy those of us who have not subscribed to our channel to please do so. Please click on the subscribe channel so you don't miss out whenever we upload new videos. Now to today's matter. Our topic for today is corporate capacity and the doctrine of ultravirus in Nigeria. Matters arising. I repeat, corporate capacity and the doctrine of ultravirus in Nigeria. Matters arising. And so in discussing this topic, we we'll first of us look at what is corporate capacity, then we we'll proceed to inquire whether all companies on the camera have the same capacity. Um, we also interrogate the legal consequences that flow from a company's refusal to state the nature of its business. And then we proceed to examine and explore the philosophy behind the requirement of the law that a company must state and define its capacity. Then we also examine the meaning of ultra via. Then we explore the terrain of the law of ultra buyers on that camera. And I need to also state that um, if you want to uh, get the uh, written uh, material, you can check uh, a description down below. See a link there. Click on the link. There you get written material on this particular topic. So without further ado, I shall then proceed to initiate on this sincerity. So that the first part the question is, what is corporate capacity? What do we mean when we talk about corporate capacity? You see, when you create a company, it is a legal person. And there are certain things that it can do. This is what is referred to as capacity. You know, there must always be a section that spells out what your company can do. The functions of a company define the capacity of that company. The object clause of the company reflects the capacity of the company. Why? It is because the nature of the business is set out in the memorandum as objects and clauses. So when you want to create or when you want to establish a company, your memorandum, in your memorandum, you state the nature of your business. That is, what business are you into? Why do you want to set up this company? What are the functions or, uh, that your company can discharge? What can your company do? The moment you try to supply answer to the question, what can your company do? Automatically, you are defining the capacity of your company. So, what you have not stated in your memo, as what your company can do translates or it means that your company is incapacitated to do so so when we talk about corporate capacity the most simplest uh, the most simple form it simply means what your company can do and uh, like i said they are norm it is normally stated in your memorandum as object and it closes it is a statement of the objectives or the type of business for which the company is registered to carry on. So I want to set up a company to probably, uh, let's say, um, buy and sell baby meals. That is basically what my company can do. That is the nature of my business, to buy and to sell. That is my capacity. Remember, we are buying and selling. We are not making 
a different case if I say to make, to buy, and to sell, to distribute. Whatever it is you have stated is the capacity of your company. And then we proceed to examine whether all companies under Kama have the same capacity. The simple answer to this is no. All companies under Kama do not have the same capacity. This is because Kama is silent on the capacity of the companies. Instead, what is obtainable under Kama is that it empowers us to define and give content to the types of capacity your company should have. To support this environment, it is pertinent for us to consider the provisions of section 27 subsection 1c which provides that it says that the nature of the business or businesses which the company is authorized to carry on or if the company is not formed for the purpose of carrying on business the nature for the of the objects for which it is established shall be stated in the memorandum of every company. Now, the above section, this section gives you the right to give content to the capacity of your company. In essence, the purposes will be stated by you. Kama has not defined your capacity. So you state what your company can do. Kama has enabled you to do so pursuant to section 27 subsection 1c. It then means that when we are talking about corporate capacity, a relevant section is section 27 1c, which says you must state the nature of your business or the object of your business in your memo. You must do so. And that is why we are saying that Kama is silent on it that has enabled you and empowered you to go ahead and define the content of your memo, that is to define your own capacity. Now, uh, the reason why our answer to this question whether uh, all companies have the same capacity under Kama is in the negative is because since Kama says every individual can go ahead to state or define its own capacity it then means that you know, individuals or incorporators will define their capacities uh, capacities in different ways so see i want to establish this company because we want to get involved in the procurement sale and distribution of electrical gadgets another car person would want to establish a company just solely to sell uh, makeup uh, accessories kids and like that so it tells you that on that camera your know, capacities of every company are different now proceed to the other question what if you do not state the nature of your business are there any legal consequences and repercussions now so this question turns on the consequences of not defining the capacity of your company in the memo as required by the act it is a well-informed view that the consequence for refusing to state the nature of one's business is that your company will not be incorporated that is your company will not be registered this is gathered from the code words of section 36 of Kama, which provides that the commission shall register the memorandum of articles unless it shall register the memorandum or articles of association unless in its opinion a they do not comply with the provisions of this act so section 36 is saying that the commission will not register your company where they have reasons to believe that you have not complied with the provisions of Kama. 
Now, if Kama in 27.1c is saying that you must state the nature of your business, it then means that once you have not stated the nature of your business in your memo, you have not complied with that provision in the Act. So, pursuant to section 36.1a, then means that the uh, commission will not incorporate your company. Um, section 37 is also important because it deals with the effects of registration, which is to make a company a body corporate. Um, so the crux of the foregoing analysis is that one must state the nature of one's business in one's memo before one's company can be registered. In essence, section 36 and 37 are parasitic on full compliance of section 27C and other relevant sections uh, on the issue of uh, registration. And so, I said the law is right that the functions of an incorporated, the function of an incorporated company typifies its capacity. Hence, the functions of your company are those that you, uh, you have actually stated in your memo. And so, it then means that when you act outside those functions, you are acting or draw as. So, when you have an act, supposing let's examine the commission. If you look at section 7 of, uh, of Kama, it talks about the functions of the commission. So, should the commission then act beyond those provisions, beyond those functions that are basically being... Um, Afforded them by the hats, then they will be acting ultra violent. And so the next one is for to examine the philosophy behind the requirement of the law that you must define the capacity of your company. The question is, why is it that the Lord says you must state the nature of your business in your memo? Why? What is the philosophy behind this requirement? I said. One cannot, in answering this, one cannot but pay attention to the admonition of Lord Rembury in the case of Cotman and Brown, where Lord Rembury stated that the purpose of the act, that the purpose the act, uh, the purpose of the act, when it says that the memorandum must state the object, is in two fold. First. Said so the company statement of object or its object clause serves to inform the intending incorporator who contemplates the investment of his capital uh, is to be put at risk. What is uh, what Lord Rembury was saying in essence is that the purpose of uh, the act are requiring that you state the nature of your business in your memo is to uh, basically meet the expectations of shareholders. Shareholders that want to advance uh, money or that want to invest in your company. So they must know what you want to use their money to do. They want to give you this money to use it for business. So they must know. And the only way they can is if they check your memo to see, oh, what business are you into? Okay, what are the functions that you can do? So they get to also know whether you are into a lawful business. So I'm saying that that is the reason why the Lord says, state your uh, uh, object clause in your memo. And I think it's very, it makes sense because supposing I, I want to invest in a particular company, and then I see a company A, they are involved in mining. I see company B, they are involved in sale of uh, shoes and the rest. And probably because of I have some sort of insider information, I'm aware that there is a, a federal government a directive or policy that will basically revoke all existing uh, licenses. And because of that, I decided not to invest in that uh, company A that is involved in mining extraction and the rest because of that inside the information so i decided to invest in company b that is uh, that the purpose of the object clause is to buy and sell shoes why because i believe it to be lucrative compared to company a then that company b 
now proceed to get involved in you know mining uh, business, the industry of mining, and then the licenses are revoked, and then we are to lots. Now you can see that they basically acted uh, contrary to my expectations. It was because I had this information that I didn't go in the first place. So it means when you state the nature of your business in your memo, it is to meet the expectations of your shareholders. But remember the Lord Rembury said in two uh, forms. So it's proceed to explain that the second one is that it also serves to inform contractual partners whether the contractual relation into which they contemplate entering with the company is one relating to a matter within its corporate object. Yes, what we are saying is that it's also, you state the nature, the law requires that you state the nature of your business in your memo so as to also protect your contractual partners. So when you state it in your memo, anybody that wants, a third party that wants to enter into any contractual agreement with the company will look at the memo, see the nature of your business, and then they will know whether it is one in which you have your capacity. So you cannot uh, have in the, your memo and say that the nature of your business is that, okay, you want to be selling shoes and then you want to then enter into a contractual agreement with me and the subject matter of the contract uh, is about making and selling rights. Making and selling rights. I said, yeah. So I wouldn't, and I wouldn't agree. I would not, uh, you know, uh, willfully agree to and to be a party to that uh, agreement. Why? Because I know that in the next future you might then turn around and say, well, 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 well. Uh, this is uh, contrary to what we have uh, in our memo. It's not, a, it's not a notarized business. A particular member will come challenge that for travelers and all and. You know, that might put me in an unfavorable uh, position. So it informs contractual partners too. And by the time we examine the case of uh, uh, when we examine the case of Asbury Railway Carriage uh, versus Richie, you would see how a contractual party had suffered from entry into an agreement with a company where the subject matter of the contract was beyond uh, the capacity of the company. And please, whenever I say capacity will be explained, it says what your company can do, that is what you have stated in your memo as the nature of your business. So uh, we proceed, okay, before we do that, uh, yeah, we proceed also to examine what ultraviolence or need. Now, the law is right that anything done on ultraviolence means is done beyond so with respect to companies, it means anything that is done outside the company's capacity. According to King, he opines that ultraviolence means a company has no power to enter into a contract which is not expressly or impliedly authorized by its constitution, that is the memo. You would also hear Paraman J in the case of Continental Chemist versus Ipia Kandu enthusing that apart from statutory parts anything done outside the stated object is ultraviolence and is not and void so ultraviolence says once you have acted beyond your capacity then it is ultraviolence if you state that the nature of your business is this and then you go contrary to what you have stated or you exceed that then it is ultraviolence so if you set up a company and you see that what the nature of your business is to simply by railway equipment. Tomorrow you cannot go ahead to now enter into an agreement or delve into uh, a business where what you want to do is to build railway. There's a difference between being in business where all you do is procure and sell railway equipment than turning to a construction company that now builds uh, railways. That would be ultra. Via. So when you do anything beyond the capacity of your company, it will be ultra via. If the nature of your business is for you to sell clothes, then if tomorrow you decide to delve into the business of uh, selling phone accessories, then it will be ultra via. Because you have acted beyond your power. You have acted beyond 
your capacity. So, we we'll also proceed to look at ultraviolence under the Nigerian law. Now, the, quest, uh, the question that comes readily to mind is whether the doctrine of ultraviolence is part of our law. To do justice to this question, it is important to state clearly that the doctrine of ultraviolence is a common law doctrine. This inevitably means that it is most likely a part of our law, since common laws that were enforced before January 1st, 1900 are to be applied in Nigeria, subject, of course, to a local enactment. In the local enactment in this regard, then, is karma. Thus, the relevant question is whether this doctrine of Otravaya is incorporated into karma. Is it recognized by karma? The answer is yes. Yes, meaning that well, the doctrine of Otravaya is a part of our laws because karma provides for it. So, this can be gathered from the provisions of section 39 of karma, which will be interrogated later in the course of this lecture. So, what we are saying is that. Uh, the doctrine of a traveler is a part of our law in Nigeria. Companies, when they act beyond uh, their capacity, their power, then they are acting for travelers. And the court can set uh, any transaction aside for being a traveler because it's a part of our law. Why? Because Kama provides for it where in section 39. Can you see the way we are proceeding? Because you know, as law students, your authorities are very important when we talk about capacity remember section 27 1c what is the effect remember sections 36 and 37 when we talk about ultravia under karma remember section 39 of karma so but will we interrogate section 39 fully later on for now let's concern ourselves uh, with the scope and nature of ultravia's doctrine as to how it was developed in England. This is important because, uh, since we recognize that uh, the doctrine has its roots in common law. So let us look at how it has evolved. You understand? Let us look at what uh, is the current uh, state of uh, that particular doctrine in England and other countries. And then uh, let us look at uh, uh, what it is to our own uh, uh, side to what is the scope, the position, the character of our own law and the doctrine of ultraviolence in Nigeria. Now, so, uh, what you need to understand is that at common law, the doctrine of ultraviolence simply means that companies were not allowed to carry out acts beyond the scope of its stated objects. Such acts were considered to be null and void. Um, the law assumed a strict form, and the courts were simply setting aside acts and transactions which were not stated in the memos as being ultraviolet. Uh, a relevant example is uh, what the courts did in the case of Asbury Railway Carriage versus Richie, where the courts ruled that it was ultraviolet for the company to contract with the financier where the subject matter of the contract involved was to make railways. The court held that this was beyond the object clause of the company as it could only use its capital to make things for railway but not to make railways themselves. Yes, I was using the fact of Ashbury Railway carriage as a switching later on as an example to initiate what ultraviolet means. means. Uh, but then, uh, the doctrine began to work at ship on companies and even their business partners because as a result of these ways were sought to evade the application of this company you know in the practitioners started looking for ways to actually tone down the rigor or the rigidity of uh, this strict application of uh, the doctrine of ultraviolet so the first dose of flexibility to the rigor of the doctrine was first seen in the paradigm change or shift in the attitude of the court to, towards the uh, doctrine. The court began to allow companies to carry on business transactions that were not stated in their memo. 
as long as these transactions were reasonably incidental to the objects of the company. And you could see the landmark case of AG versus Great Eastern Railway, where Lord Keynes held that the doctrine should be applied liberally to accommodate acts that are fairly incidental to the company's objects clause. So, yeah, flexibility started arising where uh, the court started allowing companies to get involved in acts that are not stated in their memo as long as those acts are reasonably and fairly incidental to their object clause. So they just look at it and say, okay, well, it's not in your object clause, but it is incidental to it and they will allow you. Um, however, you need to understand that with time, legal practitioners also found another way to sidetrack this doctrine. What they began to do was that they began to state so many objects in the memo, even those objects which the companies couldn't see themselves doing in the future. So what uh, legal practitioners are doing is that, okay, fine, when you want to incorporate your company, bring your memo and then state um, wide objects. So if you want to start a company to sell shoes, legal practitioners started advising incorporators that, don't just put that you want to sell shoes. Also put that you have the capacity to make shoes. Put that you have the capacity to distribute shoes. Put that you have the capacity to sell rights. Put that you have the capacity to get involved in mining business. Put that you have the capacity to sell electrical gadgets. Put that you have the capacity to make and to also sell railway equipment. Put so many things that you can actually get uh, involved in, even if you don't see yourself getting uh, involved in uh, in that particular business all conceivable businesses put them there and this was very beneficial in the sense that oh because you never can tell what will happen in the future by the time the company that has stated that oh uh, the nature of our business is to sell make and distribute shoes but they've also kept that they can get involved in the sale of electrical gadgets and all so if in the nearest future they want to delve into that business they won't be scared of oh ultra bias no why because they've stated it in their memo that they can also get involved in the business or the sale of electrical gadgets so it was very beneficial to companies but uh one thing i need to understand is that uh, this also had its own drawback one of such is that the memorandum start, uh, became bulky because they had to state wide objects. You understand? Every conceivable businesses they stated it there. So it became bulky, and then the company had to bear, you know, the cost of preparing them. And another problem with this was that they could not control the activities of their directors. Why? Because I need to create a distinction between the first doctrine, uh, the first uh, method as uh, enunciated in the case of AG versus Great Eastern Railway. In that case, yes, the court said you can do acts that are fairly incidental, but it was the court that was implying that they had the past. But in this uh, uh, this one where, comp uh, where they are stating wide objects in their uh, in their memo, you know, they will also state that, okay, you, that, okay, our directors have the past, companies have this past. So, because they were wide objects, they gave enormous pass to the directors to be able to get involved in this avalanche of uh, businesses, so to say. So it then means that they could not control the activities of uh, the directors. And also you hear Lord Rembury in the case of Cotman and Brunham criticizing this practice and they, uh, he held that it was not in compliance with the act. You know, the learned judge enthused that the object of the company and its powers are two different things and the latter were not required by the act to be stated in the memo. So Lord Rembrandt was saying that what kind of practice is this? That there's a difference between stating the object in, uh, in your memo and then stating the power in your memo. That the act only said specify your object, delineate your object, tell us what the functions of your company are, what do you, what capacity do you have, what can you do? Not that you then uh, carry powers and you don't say your directors have the powers to do this, this company has but No, put them in such a way that anybody that reads your memo will know that, okay, this is what business you are into. And that's so, that, so he was saying that there is a difference between purpose and power. So the rule that the act only provides that companies should specify their objects and know that they should state a class of acts 
that they have power to do. He affirmed that there is a difference between purpose and power. Consequently, the court resorted to what was known as the main object rule of construction. So because, you know, the courts, uh, the idea of stating wide terms did not sit well with the court. And so the court started to use the main object rule of construction. So what did the court do? Like, okay, no problem. State all your uh, objects. State them in wide terms. Put all conceivable businesses there. But by the time you come to the court, what the court will do is to interrogate, to explore. The court will explore, will traverse through all the objects you have stated, and then the court will look at which one actually gives you out, which one actually um, shows your main object. You will know what your, uh, your company is into, and that is what the court is going to uh, rely on. So, uh, this, I said this apparent shortcomings of this approach. Uh, then, it shoved legal practitioners back to their strategy board because the court was still striking out, you know, setting aside uh, uh, acts for being not traverse. Because once the court says, it's not in your main object, just strike it out, regardless of the fact that you have stated in your white thing. And so, uh, in all, as a response to uh, these, uh, you know, legal practitioners started to use the what is known as the independent object clause rule of construction. Now, the crux of this innovation was that um, they will state wide objects as uh, they used to, but then they will not put a clause that will state that the court is to consider each of the objects independently of one another, <clears throat> as if each object is the object of different companies. <clears throat> and you will see that <clears throat> this was given uh, the stamp of approval in the case of Cortman and Brown, where the court held that a clause stipulating the court, this clause stipulating that the court should not read long list of objects as subordinate to another was valid. The court, relying on subclauses 8 and 12, that is in the memo, held that the two purposes of the object were to show subscribers what their money was used for and show those who dealt with the company the extent of its past. Uh, so it held, uh, the court held that the narrower the object, the less the subscribers risk. But the wider the object, the greater the security of those who contract with the company. So in Cotman and Brown, the court accepted the independent object clause rule of construction and said, yes, well, you can put white terms and then state there that it should, those uh, object clauses should be interpreted.